Good evening. I'm Barbie Zelizer, Director of the Scholars Program in Culture and Communication, and I welcome you to tonight's lecture. If one puts visual studies and Britain together, John Ellis's name comes out right on top. And it's no wonder. For nearly four decades, he's carried out three separate lives in the temporal space usually accorded one, all of them tackling the intersection of documentary, television, video, and film. He's been an academic, a leader across British trade associations in the film and TV industry, and a producer of TV documentaries. And from all three vantage points, his commitment to the study and practice of television and its adjacent visual worlds of video and cinema has been deep and unrelenting. Schooled first in English at the University of Cambridge and then in cultural studies at the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, John pursued these three tracks at one and the same time. From the 70s onward, he taught in British and Scandinavian departments of film studies, media studies, and moving image studies, and it made me kind of happy that here in the States we call ourselves communication. Um, a television producer for nearly two decades, he was one of the first independent producers supplying Britain's Channel 4, and along the way he found time to edit the British Film Institute's production catalog for a full 25 years. This is not an individual who thinks of TV, film, and video as secondary concerns, one of the first to argue that TV viewing is fundamentally different from other kinds of viewing. He's produced an inventory of how the visual means differently across the media that use it. John's body of work attests to the richness and single-mindedness of his engagement with the topic. The production company he co-formed and co-ran, Large Door Productions, produced over 100 documentaries which range across contemporary Hong Kong, Italian architecture, French cooking, and the Brazilian TV giant Globo. He's the author of multiple academic articles and five academic books, one just recently completed, Documentary, Witness, and Self-Revelation, and one of which, Visible Fictions, drew multiple awards and translations. His service to those around him has been noteworthy. He served as vice chair of the British Producers Organization, PACT, and as vice chair of the Independent Producers Association, IPPA. Most recently, he's parlayed that service commitment back to the Academy, where he presently chairs the British University's Film and Video Council and serves as deputy chair of the British academic organization, MEXA. He's also active in the EU-funded archival projects Video Active and EU Screen, where he's helping make available the programming from over 20 European TV archives through internet streams. Now a professor of media arts at Royal Holloway University of London, John will speak to us tonight on a quarter of every hour, interstitials and the future of television. Please join me in welcoming him. Um, well, that's hard to follow. That's a very interesting person I would like to meet one day. <laughs> um, so yes, a quarter of every hour. This is terrible feedback. That's all right. Oh, I've got a wave. Yeah, that's good. Okay, well, um, what I'm talking about really are the profound changes that I think uh, are coming for television. Um, so I'm going to explore what those changes look like and then look at the place of interstitials, which are the kind of bits in between, the bits that we all kind of disregard in the television that we watch. Um, and I'm going to look at uh, that as, as a way of, of conceptualizing the future of television when television becomes less familiar than it is now. Because this is what I think is happening with television. Television has, since it, start, since it began, it's been a device. It's been a box. It's been a thing. And what's happening now is that television is no longer a device. It is becoming an application. It's becoming something that extends across different platforms. Television you can access through various different devices through various different machines. No longer is it a box, it's an application. So what is an application? It's a software mechanism. It's not a thing anymore, it's not a box. It's a software mechanism that can deliver a specific media experience to a large number of devices 
or platforms. So that's how I define an application. And what's key in that is the specific media experience. What is television as a specific media experience, which is to be delivered over different devices and platforms in the future? So we go back to really an old question, what's television? And the way I look at television is that it's something, it's a series of forms which articulate a common everydayness. We share television. And television is part of daily life, and it articulates the concerns of daily life. And it articulates them over a number of extended narrative forms. And so just to be controversial, the first of these narrative forms is news. As you can see there, we have a developing story. There's Wolf Blitzer with a developing story. News consists of developing stories. News has on television the same form as soap opera, the same form as an extended narrative fiction series, like Grey's Anatomy, another example there. News is a series of stories which we get in bits. We go for updates. We go for the next episode for what's just happened, for what is going to happen next, the predictions of what will happen next. So news is a narrative form in television, delivered in a particular way. Television also has other kinds of common everydayness forms. The soap opera, there you have affiliate soap opera. The sitcom, the sitcom which um, is different in every episode, hardly any memory from one episode to another, yet has many things, all the characters have things in common, the characters you see over and over again. So television offers us a common everydayness. And there's a new form of this everydayness, something which we in the UK call event television. Things like um, Britain's Got Talent, America's Got Talent, um, Strictly Come Dancing, the kind of shows which involve um, participants who are voted on by the audience. Shows which are an event which you have to watch at a particular point, which reinvent the old kind of form of television, the form of television where we all watch things together. And it's significant, I think, that in the UK we have a term for it. And it doesn't seem to be a term which is used very much in the American industry. We talk about event television, and we talk about event television as being one of the major features of television into the future. So there we have television articulating common everydayness in extended narrative forms. And that's the specific experience of TV. There's no other form that does that. Oh, wrong click, of course. Um, now, yeah, get back on track. The television experience, then, is of familiar characters whom we get to know, whom we see over long periods. The television experience is of stories which are told but delay the gratification of those stories. We have to wait to the next episode, to the next week, to the next series, to see what happens. But in return, what we get is not simple stories. We get extensive stories. We get multi-layered narratives where large numbers of people interact with each other. And in this form, which is distinctive, it's possible to work through both the petty concerns of life and the fundamentals of life. I think television, these extended narrative forms of television, are the only place where we get routinely in our culture the sense of how life consists of everything coming at once. All other narrative forms, like movies, for instance, give you one story. Television is able, at its best, to articulate the sense of which you're always living in several stories at once. They're bouncing off each other, they're distracting your attention from one thing to another, and so on. Television articulates that at its best, and that is its distinctiveness. Its other distinctiveness is that it is current. It's not live anymore. There's not so much live television. There's not um, that kind of sense of live connection there was in the early years of television. It's grown up, it's developed. Television is still of our moment. 
it belongs in the same time as us. Television programs are current for a week, for a fortnight. Very soon they go out of date. And it's interesting if you compare in detail an episode of a television show and a movie, the way in which the movie has ironed out a lot of the references to the immediate present that are left to sit there in a television drama, in a television show. Television is temporarily meaningful in a much more radical way than even movies are. It belongs in our shared present. So that although it's not live anymore, television still has that sense of connectedness and belongingness, which is what lies behind its sense of um, bringing people virtually together. So that's the television experience. Now, how fast is it changing? This is now to ask another question. If we, if we define the television experience in this way, well, what's happening to it? What's happening to it? So in the UK, Ofcom, the regulatory body, has done a very large survey of almost 8,000 people. Um, it was a diary-based survey over a week. And they have come up with some really remarkable findings about how people spend their time how people spend their media time in particular. So here first, we see what devices are different age groups using. And we can see, although television, which is the purpley bit, is um, highly present, it is more present in the lives of people as they get older. So 16 to 24 year olds seem to be spending less proportion of their time watching TV. However, you look a little further, the average daily minutes in that far corner, and you actually find that they're spending more time with media devices than the older people. So when you work that out, each day, they're spending just 14 minutes less than the 55 plus watching TV. So TV is still a major part even of the life, even for this growing generation. And the other thing, of course, you have to be aware of is that that 16 to 24 age group is the age group which is least likely to have established daily routines. It's one of the problems of studying students and, and, and fetishizing the young. They're the people who are trying, they're not at home, they're trying to escape the home when they're 16. When they're students, they're torn away from a lot of the established routines of their life. What I'm interested in is the 25 to 44s, who not very long back were 16 to 24. That age group is moving back into watching more television and watching more scheduled television. And as you can see, 11% they're using of radio, they're using their computers. So there's a big spread of um, media activity, which we then have to examine. So that's all media use on specific devices, television holding up there. But what are they doing when people, what are people doing when they watch television? What are they using their televisions for? They're overwhelmingly using them for scheduled television or traditional TV watching. Even the 16 to 24s are watching scheduled television for 71% of the time they're using their TVs. They're using them 10% for gaming. They're watching recorded material for most of the rest of the time on their TVs. So scheduled television is still surprisingly dominant in the UK. So the next question is, are they just watching television and just watching scheduled television, or are they doing other things at the same time? Is that use of devices that we saw in the previous slide simply discrete, or are they actually using multiple devices at the same time? Oh, yes, they are. This is what happens when people are watching TV, they're doing other things as well. Surprisingly, there's, 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 there's a significant number of people who are watching TV and watching TV. 
Well, it can, it can be done if you think about it quite easily. Um, but what are they doing? Overwhelmingly, they're using their computers at the same time. They're using computers for their emailing or social networking for 24% of their parallel device use. So a quarter of their parallel device use is communicating using a computer or um, through email or social networking. The other quarter of time, that 28% in the middle, is spent on other computer use, which can be anything. Um, using the computer to gain information, whatever it may be, it's not specified. The next large category of activity is talking on telephones, landline or mobile phones. So while they're watching TV, they're talking to people. 9% of their time is spent, spent sending texts, about which more later, which is slightly less than good old reading there reading newspapers, magazines, or books, 10% of the time spent watching TV is spent doing that as well. But this is parallel device use. This is when people are using other devices. This is the kind of way they're using them. And you can see a lot of it is about particular kinds of communication, social forms of communication. The next question is, well, how much are they actually doing that? How much are television sets used on their own? And this is a very interesting set of figures that Ofcom have, have managed to come up with. The television set is what is the machine in the house, the device in the household which is used least in parallel with other devices. There it is, 83% of television time is spent just watching TV, 17% doing other things as well. Whereas the computer is the device which is used most in conjunction with other devices. 62% of computer use happens with parallel other device. Um, a lot of that is, oddly enough, listening to music. So that's the kind of picture we get from the UK. If television is moving from a device-based television to an application, based form of television. In the UK it's happening slowly. People are watching scheduled TV on their TV sets still predominantly. So what we're seeing in, in short is a persistence of a single function attitude to devices. And from those figures about what people are doing whilst they are watching TV, the kind of social networking, talking on telephones and so on, we can speculate, and it's only speculation, that other devices are being used quite significantly to extend the sociality and the currency of television. People are talking about, texting about what they're seeing on TV with other people. Either they're participating in the TV shows by voting and so on, or they're commenting on them. We don't know how much. The Ofcom research isn't that sensitive to that particular question, but it's a reasonable speculation that a significant amount of the activity is extending the television experience into using it as a means for socializing through text or live speech. So television viewing is also a dominant activity in the UK. If we compare television viewing with internet moving image viewing, recent figures are quite extraordinary, given all the hype about online television in the UK and elsewhere. The predominance of traditional broadcast viewing is quite extraordinary, 26 hours and 13 minutes per week on average in the UK. So all, but all internet moving image viewing is two hours and 17 minutes per week. So it's not that big yet. And more, remarkably, a quarter of that viewing on internet is YouTube. And only 2.4% is the online BBC content, which is the next biggest category. So it's really a, uh, um, something which is 
in its infancy, something that probably will develop, but it's difficult to tell how it's going to develop. More to the point, what we're seeing is a very slow evolution in the British market. However, it would be wrong to extrapolate from this British experience because the other thing that is happening is that as television moves from being a single device which you can point at in, in the living rooms of the world, what's happening is that different platforms are being implemented differently. People are using different devices on two levels. At national market level, different platforms are implemented differently, and at the level of individuals as well. Things are happening that people confronted with choices, markets confronted with choices in terms of what sort of device to use, what sort of machine to use, whether it's, um, whether it's a tablet or a mobile phone, whether it's a computer, whether it's a game device which is adapted also for television use and so on. Different markets have remarkably different kind of, um, of takes on this. And at the level of individuals as well, what we're moving away from is niche television channels to niche ways of watching television. People are choosing as well at the individual level. And just to be brief, different market conditions mean that different platforms are dominating. It depends on many factors, the maturity of the television market. In China and India, there's a lot of growth left in device-led television. The history of technological in introduction is different. The mobile phone has a different role in many African markets where it is a key multifunction device. Different charging structures make people use things more and less. Free local calls drove the take-up of internet. Um, in the US, much faster than everywhere else. State infrastructure development, investment in South Korea makes that the most wired country in the world. And good old intellectual property puts a stop on a lot of things that people might do in particular markets. Here's one example. In the, U in the US, there are a lot less text messages used than in the UK. In the UK, we use texts of mobile phones rather than instant message services. And texting is widespread across all groups, all age groups, and is a long-standing habit, habit. Indeed, we can see that um, it's, in terms of minutes spent using the phone device, for all the UK population, more time is spent texting than is spent in voice calls. And for 60 to 24s, um, it is an absolute majority of the time spent using the mobile phone. In the US, well, actually, it's impossible. I haven't been able to get those figures. Nobody's asked the question. People ask how many texts are sent, you know, 16 billion, 100 billion, whatever it is. And that's a, a money-led question. Nobody's asked the social-led question. How much time are people spending doing this? And how does that break down in terms of various segments of the population? That question, not yet asked. So I can't find any comparative figures, unfortunately. I have just assert that we think that texting is an ingrained habit in, in Britain, and for the US, it is a different kind of a habit. Now, the other thing, of course, is that it's not just markets that differ, it's what individuals do. We like, you know, given all these different devices, we like different ones. We get on better with some than others, and we adapt them better to. We, have, we take their architecture and we try, as we can see here, to adapt it to what we want to do with it. And so individuals choose what suits them. And here is a random collection of images that people have posted of, of their electronic stuff different kinds of collections of devices that people use. Um, individuals choose now what suits them. So we're getting this kind of double level of, 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 of diversification in terms of where people will in the future consume television. So, now we take a short break. But when we come back, we'll be, I'll be asking, will television survive? 
And we'll find out why the most neglected and despised parts of television could just turn out to be its saviour. <laughs> There's something of importance in the air. The radio department of the J. Walter Thompson Company brings to your ears extracts from its principal programs. Frankly, we know that you, as a businessman, may not find all our programs entertaining. You may say that the selling talks would not sell you. But we ask you to remember that quite deliberately we have avoided trying to entertain or sell men like you. Most of our programs, like radio itself, are designed specifically for the great middle classes. And now a flash from what we believe to be one of the best examples of program architecture now on the air. At 10 o'clock on a sunny evening, Pond's Curl Cream presents a serenade to beauty. It is designed 100% for feminine appeal, is built on a highly emotional plane, and employs musically a new technique grouping its numbers under the frankly sentimental headings of love, names, memory, and flowers. For a life, and then who knows Rose of the world, my rose. Very probably you, as a businessman, will dislike this sentimental program. That's only natural. But on the other hand, we have proved from experience that for certain products, this type of emotional appeal is a sure winner among women listeners. So there you are. Um, advertisements, you see, they happen to other people. That's the point about advertisements. They happen to people less intelligent than ourselves. Um, they happen to women, but not to men. And that's the problem that I'm now going to address when I get round in part two, is talking about interstitials. Many people are clearly puzzled as to what interstitials might be. Um, well, that, uh, the other, the other um, feature of that uh, recording was that um, it talked about program architecture. The construction of an architecture of programming which meant that you associate various blocks together and you have something which is a building made out of different discrete objects and materials. And it's an early kind of attempt to, um, to articulate the notion of scheduling, as you call it, or scheduling, as I would call it. Um, and key to scheduling or scheduling is the interstitial. I'm calling this talk a quarter of every hour because that's being polite, really. Um, I would think that in the US, at least 20 minutes an hour is spent on what I would call interstitials because interstitials are not only the things that are in between programs, the commercials, the trailers, the links, the channel idents, and all that kind of thing, but also those parts of the actual programs which have the same characteristics as interstitials, which we shall see. So it's title and credit sequences. Those things which say previously on. Those things that kind of collide into the, the sponsor's messages. And then there's good old public service announcements. I thought I'd put those in. Um, but what's interesting is, is uh, looking at American television just now, is the disappearance on network TV of the credit sequence. The only channels that seem to have credit sequences are the premium channels. It's a way, it's almost, uh, it's like things like HBO programs still have the old fashioned credit sequence, the extravagant credit sequence, the same the, the title sequence, which is the same every week, um, which is extravagant, compared to the rest of the program, stylized compared to the rest of the program, and announces densely the themes of the program. It's as though these belong to, these are the sign of hardback television. 
whereas lack of credit sequences and title sequences is the sign of soft cover paperback television. So this is, it's interesting, it's a new development, this one, in the last five years, the disappearance of the title sequence. So interstitials, they are in the programs as well as being between the programs. What are they then? And how much of them are they? And how do they affect television? Well, first thing, I think probably most of us remember something called 24. The conceit that there was a, an episode that could last the broadcast hour. And that was the life of those characters. But on DVD, what happens? Should be renamed 18. Because the whole conceit collapses when you watch it without the structuring interstitials, the structuring breaks. And that's what interstitials do. They structure the output of television. They provide that architecture. And if you look at this, this is, this is actually an analysis of um, an episode of House. The green is the program. The red is the breaks, the break pattern. So you see that you're allowed um, about 10 to 12 minutes, maybe 15 max, um, before the first break. Then you have a major series of breaks quite frequently, one after another getting longer towards the middle. And then you see towards the end, the sections of the program get longer again, and the breaks get slightly shorter. And that seems to be a fairly common way of structuring the output of network programs in the US just now. The breaks are spacing out the television programs. They're regulating the flow of television. But what they're also doing is building patterns of expectation. And I'm very grateful to a student from Yannenberg who, who, who sent me um, a link to some research which seems to be proving this. Um, I've still got to think about it and met their methods. But it, suddenly there's a piece of work that says, um, well, actually, this building of expectations. People enjoy television more when there are breaks, which is what I suspected. But there's, there's the first piece of empirical research that shows that that might be the case, that building the patterns of expectation, the frustration, or at least the kind of delay of gratification, is an important feature of how television works. So that's what interstitials do. But what are they? Well, what happens in those so-called breaks? Well, we're shown groups of small bits. But what we don't, well, that, that, you know, most, most programs are like that, groups of small bits. But what we don't do is make connections between each of those interstitials. Here, for example, you could have a commercial for um, an extremely bad item of diet, followed by a trail for America's Biggest Loser, followed by another commercial for um, diabetic medicine. Nobody makes connections between those three things. But if those were scenes in a television program, scenes in a movie, we would. So something's happened here. Interstitials are shown in groups, but we don't make connections between them. They're a special class of television output, therefore. They have a high degree of separation one from another, much more than um, anything else that happens on TV. So what does that tell us about them? Well, they are designed for multiple repetition in quick succession on the same channel. As a rule, we don't like repeats. We don't like seeing the same shows again, unless it's a distance of a year or two when it becomes nostalgia. But commercials, trails, we see them repeatedly on the same channel in the same space of an hour or two's viewing. So as a result, what do they have to be? If they are repeated that often, they have to be technically perfect. No bloopers in commercials. 
No loose ends in commercials. No bad bits in the promos. They are also, if they're to keep our attention, quite often enigmatic, synoptic, dense and elusive. You don't necessarily understand them the first time or the second time round. Or if you do understand them, you see the second, third time round, you begin to see more levels in them, if they're any good. And in connection with that, they have greater per minute production values than the programs that surround them. They cost more per minute. And indeed what they are, in television terms, is aspirational production values. Commercials are what programs want to be when they grow up or when they get proper budgets. Commercials have, through the history of television, led the way in showing the way that television could look if we could afford to make it like that. And I'm convinced that, that uh, what happens in the interstices of television has driven the escalation of production values in the content of television shows. So what did interstitials do as well? Well, if you think about it, the interstitials are all future-oriented. The programs are not. So you're being given two contrasting time frames in an hour of commercial television. Interstitials are about future consumption. Future consumption of shows. Future consumption of commodities, future consumption of drugs. They're about what, what's coming up next. They're driven by the future. And so when you go back to the programs, you go back to an enhanced sense of the present. So what the interstices do as well is to intensify that feeling of currency of the programs. Since they're addressing futures, when you get back to the show, that belongs to another time frame. And that's the real adjustment that you make in and out of breaks. You say, right, well, this belongs to the currency of this drama, the currency of this news. This belongs to my present moment. The interstices are about what I could be doing in the future. So you move back and forth between a hypothetical future and a much more concretized present by the interstitials. The other thing about interstitials is that they are functioning more and more as how-to guides. And this is where they're going to take us in the future. Commercials show you how to consume. We've known that for a long time. Commercials say, well, this, this is what you should be doing with your time and your money. If, but if commercials show you how to consume, the other interstitials are also guides to how to behave. Channel idents, good examples on Bravo, these are old ones, I think. They show you what the channel's attitude is, or at least what the channel expects you to get from it. And trailers tell you what to watch, but they also define, they define the generic forms of television. They refresh your understanding of what a documentary is, what a news is, what a sitcom is. They refresh, condense those definitions so you're up to date with them. And they define, therefore, how to watch, what to expect of particular kind of programs, what kind of experience to expect. So they are little how-to guides. And it's interesting if you go back and look at the few old trailers that you can get hold of, how much they actually function to tell you what kind of television people were watching and how during that period. But so I think going forward, when television becomes an application, these kinds of interstitials are going to increase in their importance. Because if television becomes an application across different kind of platforms, which are different in different territories and are different in different people's hands and households, television will gradually cease to be the taken-for-granted medium that it is now. That different kinds of television practices will grow up in different nations, 
and in different households and in diff diff different people's personal practices. And the danger then is, of course, that television, once it's lost, it's taken for granted status. Things become more difficult. The things that we take for granted then have to be um, re-established for us or established for newer viewers. Things like the relationship between a series and its parts. How do we understand what an episode is and how that relates to an imaginary, much greater whole in which these characters are living? We would have to understand what currency is about, what, what a week is what the television week is and how that works and how programs lose their value of currency uh, relatively fast. We would have to begin to understand again the extensive and multi-layered narratives and how they work. We'd have to get used to the delayed narrative gratification which is a feature of television. We even have to get used to what a sitcom is that thing that television, the new aesthetic form that television invented for itself, we'd have to get used to what formats are again, as all of these get defamiliarized. And I think the future role of interstitials is therefore in this realm, to promote not only programs, but the understanding of the experience of television itself, to enable television content as it passes over different platforms and the different ways in which people are using those devices. And that's necessary because television does give us something really very important in our fragmenting societies, which is still a virtual togetherness, a sense that we can be around events, that we do have a common currency in our lives, which is defined not primarily by news, by television fictions and by the lives of those characters who are working through the mundane and important experiences that we are also living through. So, now, it's your turn. <laughs>